Welcome to another session of Alumni Live. It's a continuing opportunity to, to bring the Grand Valley, the film and video community together. We've put together a really nice group of folks today. So I'd like to have everybody introduce themselves um, and really uh, tell us who you are, uh, tell us when you were involved, if you're still involved with Grand Valley or not, and um, how you got connected to the college. What was it that brought you there uh, or who was it that brought you there? Hi, my name is Greg McNeil. Um, I graduated around 1996, I think in December of 1996. And uh, I came into the program from uh, another school. And it was actually, um, I was going to Ohio University at the time and ran out of money and uh, was looking for another school. And my grandmother ran into a an article that she read about Julian Boyance, who had interned on a Spike Lee movie. And she told me, oh, you should check out Grand Valley State. And so on my break, I came up to visit her and toured Grand Valley. And that's how I got involved. So I came in mid, mid, um, mid year to, uh, to the film program. My name is Gerb Eefsting. I was a student at uh, William James, actually started at Thomas Jefferson and then transferred to William James. Um, I heard about uh, Grand Valley's experiment with alternative education within the Grand Rapids peace community. I was quite a activist, uh, draft resistor, anti-war activist, and uh, within that uh, culture group of people, we, we heard about mm -hmm. Grand Valley State Colleges, which was the concept called the Cluster Colleges. And, Part of that cluster was uh, Thomas Jefferson College and uh, William James College. And Thomas Jefferson was offered a bachelor's in philosophy and um, William James was a bachelor of arts and bachelor of science. And I think what attracted me to uh, transfer to William James was the arts and media major. And we're talking 1972 where the, we had experienced the second coming of television, which was uh, cable TV, was one technological change. And then uh, they developed the Sony port pack portable half-inch black and white recording capability. And it became a, uh, an important part of social change to make media that uh, helped facilitate social change. So that was really what uh, got me involved in James and an incredible journey, a perfect storm, the people that were there, the whole thing I could go on for days. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's informed my life. And then I also had the opportunity as an adjunct back in the 90s or yeah, ahead from my graduation to uh, the 90s to, to, to uh, adjunct in, uh, in the 60 millimeter film program. So we'll talk more about that later, I think. Hi, everyone. I am Stephanie Coriatis. I graduated in 2013. Um, I first heard of the Grand Valley Film Program through a friend of mine who was actually a freshman and just getting um, accepted into the program. And I had been, at that point, a high schooler dabbling into you know low-budget YouTube videos and very much... Um, very much aware that I wanted to pursue film. And he was talking to me and said, hey, it's a, it's a great program. I love it so far. And I went on one campus tour and loved it. And at that point, I just, I, I fell in love with the program. Um, I was there for four years and um, I get a little emotional thinking about, it, but it was certainly, it was some of the best four years of my life. Um, so I, I owe a lot to Grand Valley and, and look back fondly on my time there. Hi, I'm John Philbin. Uh, I didn't go to Grand Valley, but I taught there for 23 years, just retired uh, in December. Um, how do I got connected? I saw an ad for a professor of film and uh, I flew up on an icy January day where they had to hose down the wings of the plane to de-ice them and uh, landed and saw the campus, met Tony Perrine, who you were going to see here in a moment, uh, who picked me up at the airport and, uh, you know, the rest is history. 
Hi, my name is Tony Perrine, and like my brother John there, I'm a former faculty member. I started in 1989 and retired just um, this past December. And um, I was also, um, it's kind of the way you get an academic job. You see the, the job posting, you apply. It's a pretty rigorous process. Um, one of the women who hired me called it a stamina test. Um, so Deanna Morris and Barb Roos are the two women who were instrumental in hiring me. Um, and yeah, it was ideal position for me because it was in Michigan, which is my home state, and I was happy to return here. And um, it replicated a lot of things that I appreciated most in my film education, which again, we'll be talking more about later, but yeah, it's, it was a great 30 years. Uh, I guess to not introduce myself, I'm Tim Sunt. I actually attended William James College, that college right there. Um, graduated in 1982, so I came where video was really starting to come in. I really didn't have much uh, contact with film at all. I really was involved more in video and uh, television production, so I saw more of that side. Um, learned to appreciate the disciplines that film brings in, because a lot of that carried over into video production. Um, and then I've since stayed connected with the college, um, talking to classes, and uh, I'm still in the area, so it's not hard to stay connected. But uh, that's that's my background. That's how I came. I actually came there because uh, I live in the east side of Michigan, not that far away, but never heard of the college. Got a mailing saying we'll give you 500 bucks a year, which back then was a significant amount when you consider uh, read it and weep $33 a credit hour back in the day. Um, so I looked at it, looked at the catalog and said, hey, they actually have something I want to go into. Um, came out, looked at the college and started uh, in the fall. Having heard where everybody came from and how they connected the school, what was it that you found unique about the school, both when you began there, what brought you there, and as, you're, as you spent more time with the classes, the school, the students, the faculty? Gerb, I'll start with you, because uh, okay. you're of my era. <laughs> yes, a little bit before. Um, yeah, so this is 1972 to 1976 is, you know, my time at James. And just to put that in context, it was a period of great social change, as I mentioned earlier about uh, the anti-war. So I actually graduated high school in 1968, and I was successfully able to resist the draft uh, for four years um, through a lot of, you know, uh, education and understanding and support. When I started James, it was four years after uh, high school. And so the my contemporaries who had been drafted, who had joined and who had come back from Vietnam were the people that I kind of hung with at James. And these were the most active anti-war people on campus were the veterans. And, uh, and because I was the same age, I was attracted to that community. So there was a lot of uh, uh, social uh, activity in terms of uh, ending the war. That really uh, colored my first two, three years of being at James. We made films around that issue. We traveled to um, uh, Washington, D.C. on a couple of occasions. Uh, Nixon was inaugurated in 1973. And the uh, people, the community of filmmakers from Grand Valley, we went, we documented this. We came back and did a presentation to different local high schools, a, a multimedia show uh, about, the, the, um, about the war. And uh, so that was really, you know, and, and the other part that really is important, I think, historically, as I mentioned earlier, cable television was coming to the country. And actually, the whole country got involved in this talk of what does it mean that we go from three channels to 500 channels in some community. And it became a First Amendment issue, freedom of speech, that people should have access to this. And so what got invented, and this was a national conversation, <laughs> Congress was involved, the 1976 Cable Act, a student group and a citizen group uh, who were educated about the importance of cable to a democracy, to people having access, uh, 
got together and we educated and lobbied the Grand Rapids City Commission. Cable companies would come and negotiate with the city because they needed to use the right-of-ways. And anyway, this established a really good model in Grand Rapids for public access TV, and it's still going on today. Um, and I, I'm very proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that uh, my education had to do with social involvement. It wasn't this sort of ivory tower kind of thing. It was really involved in the community. And at that time, there were so many other areas, uh, environmental studies, uh, mm -hmm. urban planning. Those were all things going on at James at the time. It was really at the forefront of all the sort of revolutions and alternatives that were happening. And uh, it was really exciting. And then from there, I just got into, there was also a film program. And it was called 60 millimeter one and 60 millimeter two. And 60 millimeter one was learning how to use Bolex and shoot film, expose film, and actually edit film. And then 60 millimeter two, it upped a little bit to doing, uh, you know, what we call double system and uh, sound. Uh, and it became a little more sophisticated. And and it was out of that program that the the Grand Valley also, William James developed a, a a study abroad program. And I got to go for a semester and study at the Italian Institute of Cinematography in Rome. For and I, I was there for almost eight months. Uh, Twelve of us went, and it was a pilot program. The Grand Valley paid for the entire amount, and uh, it was an amazing uh, experience to go. And that's really where I kind of made my career as a filmmaker, director of photography, and upon graduation, that's how I, you know, made my living for the next uh, 30 years, and I, I still work in the media, so. I'd like to jump to a, a faculty perspective, so I'll start with uh, Tony, because you obviously had experience at other schools. What was it you found that was unique about the school and about the program when you came to Grand Valley? Yeah, so my experience at other schools was actually as a student. Grand Valley was my first and only full-time teaching job. Um, so when I first came here to teach, I was a total newbie. But um, yeah, I, I um, did my master's degree at the University of Michigan and my PhD at Northwestern University. And what was important to both of those programs that I attended previously to coming to Grand Valley was the idea of combining theory and practice so we were both learning how to use the tools um, and you know that's an important part of it especially back in the world of film um, production because it's a pretty exacting craft but um, that the theoretical perspectives the history um, the, the critical studies part is an important part of what um, students need and it kind of connects to what group was talking about in terms of understanding the importance and significance of media and film um, that you're doing something significant with this um, well you know whatever mode that you choose to work in and that hopefully you understand the power of the medium and and use it um, to create um, significant work and i would say that was one of the through lines for um, william james to the school of communications because william james the motto, which all the students see when they're in Lake Superior Hall, is um, no impression without expression. In other words, you don't really retain what you're learning unless you're doing something with it, and so and hopefully doing something significant with it. So William James' idea was carried through into the School of uh, Communications when it formed in 1984, um, and in fact, a lot of the faculty who uh, taught in William James were the ones who created the School of Communications. And that um, idea of theory and practice kind of evolved into integrating liberal and professional education. So that was kind of what the School of Communication was all about. Um, and so that kind of theory and practice, doing it and also analyzing it, criticizing it, learning the history, understanding the social context, being aware of the power of these powerful media. Um, so that that was all um, part of what carried through the different iterations, if, if you will, of um, uh, film and video production at Grand Valley. 
and uh, yeah, I mostly did the film studies part, but when I started, what was really cool about it was I got to teach just about everything in the curriculum um, before we kind of became bigger and more specialized. So that was really fun as a teacher to, to both teach film studies and film production, um, which you don't have the opportunity to do at a lot of other places. We'll get back to a couple of students yet, but I might as well stay in this tack with uh, John. Uh, I'm not sure where you came from coming to Grand Valley, but tell me about what is it you found when you came to Grand Valley that was unique, what was different for you? Um, yeah, I, I was an adjunct for uh, at Columbia College, Chicago, and then I went to uh, Southern Illinois at Carbondale, got my MFA there, and I was became a lecturer uh, there before I came up to Grand Valley. But I, I you know going off of what Tony said, I remember the School of Calm thinking that was very unique uh, because in Southern Illinois and at and at Columbia College, you know, it was very much the film program was off on its own, which is fine, but it was very much like a little silo that that did its own thing, and and the School of Communications blended film and video production with television broadcasting with journalism, comm studies, and so on, and I thought that was actually very interesting partly because you know i you know i i did a little journalism when i was in school working for the school newspaper and i did television and i did you know regular motion pictures uh and so i liked the idea that they were all blended together and i think at some point it got so big that it became a little unwieldy in that regard but when i started it was, i thought it was unique now, Stephanie, you're the most recent grad, so let's jump up to, to your era. Um, what was it that, I'm not sure if it was something that you recognized before you came to Grand Valley or really appreciated when you got there or both, but tell us about your, what is it that really stuck out? What made it unique for you? Yeah, I was, I've been thinking about this question a lot, and I think um, for me, I think the the faculty is what make it so unique. Uh, I know that uh, the relationships that I was able to develop and connect with the faculty, those are lifelong. Um, I am still going to my advisor and <laughs> for life advice and uh, continue to have that relationship today. Um, I remember when I, I think I was a sophomore, so it was my second year in the program, and uh, just chit-chatting with Kim Roberts. And um, I said, Kim, do you have any children? And she goes, I don't have kids. I don't have time. I have all of you guys. And I was like, oh, yes, that's you are our mother. <laughs> so I think back to that and how that kind of um, really impacted me and made my time more meaningful. Um, I mean, I can even think back to working with John, working with Tony and having moments of just total film school meltdowns as you do when you're in film school and having them be there for me was something that I don't think I would have been able to get anywhere else. Um, and like I said, um, my connection with the faculty has maintained uh, since I graduated almost eight years ago, nine years ago now. Um, and uh, it's something that I think very unique to the program. I know that I haven't had that experience um, anywhere elsewhere, and um, I, I'm so thankful for it. I'm going to finish up with Greg. Um, you were really there at the school at a time when both the school and a lot of society was changing. Media was becoming a lot more part of our lives, a lot more awareness, more things going on. Technology was changing. What was it about it? And you had come from a different school, so you had some other perspectives. What was it about Grand Valley that really stuck out to you or continues to? What, I, what really stood out to me was just how self-directed we were all expected to be. And the school of calm itself was very much on its own, just doing its own thing. And as students, we were expected to be that kind of self-directed force of nature. You know, we were given remits and we went on and did our thing. And that came down to everything. You know, all the technology at the school of calm was open to us and it was there for our taking. And when I first got there, I asked, what, what, what's that device in the back of the room there? Oh, that's the optical printer. I'm like, oh, how do, you, how do you use that? Well, here's the manual, figure it out. And we were given all of this, all of these toys and this huge sandbox. 
and we were just told to go forth and and do our thing and i think that's what really really helped me in my later pursuits because i knew that i had within me the the power and the confidence to go forth and do whatever i needed to do without asking permission or looking for approval necessarily and i think that's what what made uh made my experience at grand valley unique we were very much on our own and within our group within our own filmmaker group we got very close and we were kind of doing our own thing and it was pretty fantastic and tony you had a thought that you wanted to add in here yeah i wanted to follow up on something that stephanie said actually which is about the faculty in the program um, and i've had the opportunity and pleasure to meet many of them um, <laughs> over the years and in fact somehow i became like the senior faculty person for my last few years but um, of course we've had fabulous students and um, that goes without saying hopefully it speaks for itself but we have also benefited from a lot of talented dedicated and hardworking teachers who haven't um, always been as supported as they might have been by the university in terms of resources. So we've actually done a lot with kind of not, um, well, I will say limited resources over time, um, but we've been supported and energized by a lot of visit visiting faculty members, a lot of adjuncts, a number of whom have actually been alums. So they, uh, I mean, I think it's a wonderful way that so many people have given back to our program and to our university. And I just wanted to mention a few names, Gerb here, of course, um, Suzanne, who's in the background there, um, one of the producers of the show, Melissa Bowman, Pete Porter, Maggie Anarino, Gretchen Vintage, Carrie Vanderhoff, Joel Petrikas, Spencer Everhart, Ryan Copping, Sarah Vesley Naraki. There are others that I've missed who are adjuncts. Um, and these are all people who went through the program and um, then, then, then you know, dedicated their talents to keeping it strong. So that's, I just wanted to put in that word of appreciation for all those people who really energized the program over the years. Now, one other name, of course, that's in there is is Barb Bruce. Uh, we have a clip we're going to be looking at pretty close, uh, quick coming up here. Uh, Barb taught for, I'm not sure how many years. She was there I when was I was- 35 years? 35 years. I think it was, uh, I th I'm counting 40. 40, so. okay. Oh, well, she, so she was there before she was like- She was there. adjuncting when I was there, it's between okay. 72. And I think it was in 77 that um, they offered her a full-time position. So. 77, okay. yeah. yeah. Well, I, I came there in 78. She was my advisor and just seemed like she had been there, probably had been since, you know, almost the beginning of it. So it was a tremendous force. And I think you know, that force is still uh, felt through all the students and staff who were and faculty who were there because she was there for such a long time and had a great impact. She did a um, documentary about WJC. And we're going to see a clip coming up here. And uh, if you want to see the whole presentation, we're going to put a link on here as well. But let's just look at a clip talking about the conversation that was William James. These are not the ivory towers of a traditional American college, nor are these traditional halls of ivy. William James College was founded in 1971 as an alternative college. Our inspiration, the philosopher William James, the psychologist, the artist, and teacher William James. He taught us that we learn in order to act. At James, we tried to merge theory with practice and balance individualism with a commitment to community. The qualities that I saw in people were sort of self-initiative, willing to follow things through, willing to take risks for willingness to fail, and a desire to really do what it took to get the job done, which in many times meant a lot of work and a lot of redoing. Well, somebody else I should mention, too, who was in that uh, clip is Deanna Morris. I actually was in Deanna's first animation class that she taught in 79, um, who has also been very involved in the college going along there. I came to Grand Valley in 1979. I had a background in alternative education, in fact. My first master's was from Goddard College. In 
fact, that's the only thing that would bring me to the Midwest. These were some of the buzzwords of the time. Apparently, this is what I look like today, according to a seven-year-old. Going back to the William James days, because as Gerb was mentioning earlier, it was uh, a cluster college concept. It was very kind of unique at the time. It's what drew a lot of attention um, to at least the, the film video areas where a lot of people came into it. But it really was a different a different approach because it was a small college. There was a lot of great, you know, um, interactivity. The community was very strong. And I think it's, it's you know, you realize it's, it's your community. It's your social group. Um, later on, professionally, you call it your network. But it's the same thing. It's the people that know you, that you work with, that you have contact with. Um, let's go back to folks who were involved who knew William James and tell me what it was that... Um, that really fit the way a film and video program fit with that whole philosophy. I came to Grand Valley State Colleges specifically to go to William James College from Washington, D.C. in 1972. I wanted to go into social relations. However, about halfway through, I took a 15 credit class called Community Video Workshop taught by Bob Conroe. I think there were 12 or 15 people in it. Anyway, it was the most exciting thing to me and I pursued my arts and media concentration. Anyway, I have saved a couple of my textbooks I thought you'd want to check out. The Spaghetti City Video Manual, Signs of the Times, and the Guerrilla Television Book, which was $3.95 as a textbook, not bad. One of the things that I think was really unique about James is that the you sometimes couldn't tell the faculty from the students. Now, this was also a back to the social period because you had these uh, returning warriors <laughs> from the Vietnam War, so they were older. It was also the women's movement and a lot of women who had been, you know, uh, raised in a traditional family culture uh, decided that maybe that wasn't going to fulfill them. and. So there were older women that came back to go to college. So it was a very diverse community in that sense from an age standpoint. And also because of the nature of the, the times. Uh, and so much new stuff is going on. You know, it's like alternative was this key term. Alternative everything. Alternative counterculture also was a term like against the dominant culture of the time. But um, so faculty would sometimes and many times teach courses that they weren't necessarily had majored in or were you know trained in because they were interested. I think uh, one of my important teachers there was Bob Conroe, who was an English PhD, uh, you know, a writer, written books, and and he was fascinated by the the, the video movement, and so he. He taught courses, but he didn't know the first thing about making videos. And, and that was sort of this sense of we were all on this journey together. That was, that's what made it so exciting. And uh, the life experience of uh, people. And I think the other thing that for me was so powerful was William James felt like a matriarchy. It was the women that were running the college. We had a, Adrian Tinsley was the dean. Uh, there was an assistant dean, Rhonda Rivera, who was an attorney, um, and then Barbara, of course, and Tony and Deanna. It was a really, uh, you know, it was the, it was what the, what the women's movement could really say, you know, let the women run things and see how they do. And it was an incredible uh, experience for me. And uh, 
you know, this idea that faculty and students, you couldn't tell them apart. I think that's what kind of led me and Barbara to become partners and friends. We, we collaborated in film and, you know, then we collaborated in having a family together. And so, uh, and, you know, that was, that's, so, you know, we were, we were filmmakers together and uh, at always different levels of experience. And that's the beauty of film. It's a, it's a tribal experience is what I, I think of. Central to the idea of the college was the integration of theory and practice and assistance that what we learn be useful in the world. Well, part of the dynamic back then, too, was that you had on campus both a radio station and TV station. So a lot of the people who were in the program back in those days in the you know, uh, 70s, 80s, uh, either were then trying out things at um, WGVU. I worked there for three and a half years doing, you know, a lot of it was not really film work, but it's doing sports. It's doing production and learning to work with a team. It was a great way to learn. Um, so when you got out in the work world, you had that work experience. Also saw some very experimental stuff going on. Uh, Walter Wright was a professor there who would come to the studio at night with some of the students and just try um, some very different uh, video projects they were working on. And also the, the radio station on campus, and I'm going to admit that I just blanked out what the call letters used to be before. Was, uh, WSRX. SRX, Student Run Experimental. And it was experimental. It was student run. They tried a lot of different things. There were dramas. There were daily programs. Um, but those two areas gave a lot of students kind of a, a way to then use the energy and some of the ideas they had, both um, in video or on radio, to kind of experiment, have fun with things, learn, and it was a great part of that dynamic. We had a small studio in uh, the basement of Manitou Hall, and we did a little black and white studio. We had uh, two blunder tongue uh, video cameras, uh, television cameras on heads, studio heads and peds, and our headsets were like those kind you see in the old movies, you know, the old operators had, you know, and uh, we had what we called a ka-chunk switcher so when the director said you know ready one take one um you heard this ka-chunk <laughs> and then we, we call it the ka-chunk switcher but it was in the basement of manitou and most all of us ended up working up at wgbc i was one of the announcers who did the um all the voiceovers and the ids and so on so um, we had a lot of fun doing that we worked in master control production control studio cameras and so on. It was great training for us all to get our hands on the stuff. And so concentration was a great, uh, great program. I started after William James, but um, a lot of my colleagues, again, were part of it. And I felt kind of um, envious, <laughs> like I had missed something that was really cool. And I think you get that from listening to Gerb and Tim talk about the experience. It was a much smaller place. It was very experimental. It was, you know, literally an experimental college. And insofar as it was the, the laid the groundwork for the School of Communications that, you know, some of that aspect did carry through. But the School of Communications became a much larger entity, it had eight different majors and a grad program and went from like, um, I think 12 faculty when I started teaching there to 30 by the time it uh, was reorganized a couple of years ago when film and video and photography were added to the um, art and design major. So it became a new entity, visual and media arts. But the School of Communications uh, and the university in general became a much larger and I guess I would also have to say more conventional place. Um, so that's one thing that was perhaps lost what, uh, with growth and with success was that ability to, um, and it was you know, a changing cultural context as well. But the, um, the things that we held on to, I think were, were part of what makes the phone video program unique. The showcases, we, you know, originally they just showed their final films in, in uh, final exam class, you know, day in class. And then we said, you know, what, let's get them all together and do it in a public venue and invite all the actors and family and everybody. And, and I remember first we had just a once a year showcase and then there was just too many films. And so we had, now let's have one every semester. And there's still too many films, you know, and then we said, well, let's have one each season. We'll have a fall, a winter and a spring showcase. Uh, and the winter showcase, we, we made it a little different because we, uh, we opened it to all class levels, freshman through senior, and we had awards and all that kind of thing. 
you know, it was just a great way to get everybody together. You know, everybody sees each other in class, but it's a real celebratory event. And it's also great as a filmmaker to have outsiders come and watch your work and, you know, laugh in the right place and applaud and so on. Uh, you know, that exhibition part of the process is important. Everyone focuses on the writing and the, the production and the editing, but then you got to show it. And uh, that was, uh, and get together with your fellow filmmakers. I do want to just mention too that we've had like a lot of successful students, obviously a lot of successful uh, student work, working through a lot of different um, media. I, and that includes film and video and audio and writing and also film studies. And so um, we started doing showcases of student work. Well, we, we always did it in various ways, um, but became more formalized starting in the 90s. And part of that was uh, premiering the summer film, which my colleague John Fulman will be talking about in a minute. But um, some of it was just like to, to provide a, um, an audience for the work that students produced in a kind of more you know, formal setting. So we would have a big auditorium, invite people's families, friends, of course, cast and crew members to come. These, these showcases became kind of a big part of the end of each semester. Um, but what, what that the showcases didn't provide was a place for all of the history, theory, criticism type work. So the film studies part of the curriculum. And so about 10 years ago, it was actually a group of students who had the idea of starting a student-run film journal. And that um, eventually, after like a semester or so of planning, became um, Synesthesia, which has now been publishing for about 10 years. And I just wanted to share a couple of statistics. Um, yeah, volume one was published in 2013. We've published about 20 issues since then, a total of 86 papers. Um, there have been uh, 95,000 downloads of papers published in synesthesia around the world. So that's one thing that's really cool, um, that students have the ability to share their written scholarly critical work with not just you know the Grand Valley audience, but also um, interested people around the world. So if you get a chance, go to that website and take a look at all the places where these, these um, papers have been downloaded and appreciated. And not only our um, scholarly work included, but also artwork and photography. So it's been a nice venue for publishing the film studies part of the program that complements nicely the showcases of um, the students' production work. We'll get back to the beginning, the origins. You know, I was asked to teach the film classes, which was 16.1 and 16.2. Um, and so I started that um, with the 16-1 class, and that's the basics, uh, how to run a Bolex. And, but, you know, I just was feeling a lot of energy for this opportunity for me to, to talk to young people, to teach them about filmmaking. And uh, they got this sense of momentum. So the same students would end up taking 16-2. So we already felt like a community, a tribe. And uh, one of the students, I think it might have been a student named Bill Gerhardt, who's now very successful as a director in uh, Los Angeles. He works a lot on AMC series. But um, he had a script called Seizure, and it was an interesting story. And so we, we combined this, you know, our resources as a class and spent the, the semester, which is about 14 weeks, making this film in 16 millimeter. And then we actually had a premiere event at Studio 28. And so all very successful, huge turnout. Just the energy was fantastic. The second year kind of followed the same thing, but this time we had a, a, a student, Julian Boyance, who had a script called To Overlook Beauty, which was a narrative fiction, but it was about teenage suicide. We did that then as 16.2, premiered it for two nights at, I think, once in Studio 28 and once in Muskegon. And then the third year, what we did to create it, to up the ante, so to speak, was we shot in Super 16. 
And Super 16 is a format that came around to kind of, it's the same aspect ratio as HDTV. And it lends itself well to blowing up your final product to 35 millimeter film, which at that time, 35 millimeter film was the standard projection format. Our previous two years, we would bring in a 16 millimeter projector into this movie theater and project, you know, our 16 millimeter film. Of course, it didn't match what, uh, you know, patrons would usually see at the theater. So this idea was now let's bring a 35 millimeter print. So this was all about a comedy uh, called Life Yucks. And the students each got to do a little comedy segment. And we ended up with a 35 millimeter print. Uh, I think we might have even had four nights of, of screening. And so that just every year we seem to do something a little bit more. And then I think it was, uh, you know, I have to mention this incredible support from uh, the, the uh, School of Communications uh, faculty and one person in particular, uh, Alex Nestorinko. He was the director of the School of Com and he really... Uh, really supported what we were doing and and su continued it. So then that conversation says, how could what could we do uh, beyond that? And that was the uh, how the summer film program got to. So instead of one semester, uh, why not the whole summer? And uh, so that's that's how we developed it. And the other part that really you know put a lot of energy into it was this idea of. Um, uh, bringing in guests, either, you know, film people, lectures. But we contacted, a, you know, I saw an ad in the American Cinematographer for this Fuji film, and it was this woman, Irish, five foot two, red haired uh, woman, and it was, her name was Brianne Murphy, and she was the first woman to ever become a member of the American Society of Cinematographers. And this is a huge deal. The American Society of Cinematographers is the most prestigious organization that you can become a member of. Uh, as 100 members, you can only, only opens up if somebody dies. It takes two other members to nominate you. Brianne had been the DP on all of the Little House on the Prairie uh, TV series with uh, Michael Landon, was the director of that, who was, you know. Anyway, there's a lot of history so Brianne agreed to become sort of a mentor to the summer film program with her connections in Hollywood. She also asked if she could bring her sister, who was a script supervisor for 30 years. Her name is Jillian Murphy. And uh, this, that Hollywood connection made a lot of things happen, which also then connected us to Panavision, who had a new program called the, the New Filmmaker Program. And it was the second year, the first year they had given a Panavision package to U of M. They require, uh, the, the, pa the camera package is free, but you have to insure the camera package, which is about 10 cases of equipment. And they insure, and it had to be insured for a million dollars. The first year uh, that U of M had it, they said it can, it, it can it has to stay in this room. And so, uh, but we, we, we have, but Grand Valley came, put up with the money. They put up the insurance. And so we had this 10, 10 cases of Panavision equipment. And uh, we had a great time making this film. And so then uh, the program was so successful that Grand Valley said, we need a full-time tenured faculty person to run this program. And I didn't qualify because of a lack of advanced degrees. So... I had to sort of step out of the way, and that's how eventually John came to be uh, in charge of that program. And, who, and I think he's done a fantastic job right from the beginning. I remember going to the premiere of uh, the the gate. The, what was it called? The the Go Piece. Yes, very good film. So anyway, that's uh, in in uh, short uh, how this how this all got into the summer film program. I guess I would just go back and say you can't tell the story of Grand Valley without talking about the growth. I mean, when I started, there was maybe 12,000 total students, and when I left, there was close to 30,000. Every fall, I would drive into the campus, and there'd be a new building, and I would I would be like, what is that? Where did that, where did that come from? Um, and 
I remember when I came, as Tony said, I came to Grand Valley and I actually pitched the idea of a summer film project in Southern Illinois. And they were like, well, it's a cool idea, but we can't afford to do that. And then I came up and they said, hey, we have a thing called the summer film project here. And I was like, that's a great idea, uh, which I think Gerb was, was the, the guy who launched the first one. Um, year after year, it just got bigger. It's this intensive program where it's like boot camp. I mean, you're on set for, you know, sometimes five days, sometimes, you know, 12 days, 10, 12 hours a day. And you're really, you know, learning as close as you can get to what it's going to be like in a, in film production if you get a, a career in that. And, you know, we we started to bring in, as it, as it grew, we started to bring in a Hollywood um, DP, Jack Anderson, and he, he brought the Panaflex Super 16 along. Uh, we started to bring in Hollywood actors, James Karen, uh, Paulie Perrette from uh, uh, NCIS and, and so on. Uh, the screenwriting got better, the actors got better, um, the crews got bigger, um, and, and you know, the other, Thing about 20 years at Grand Valley is, is the technology keeps changing. You know, I started, it was, we shot, it, not at the summer film, but we shot in media production classes on VHS and then SVHS and then mini DV and the beta cam. And now it's all tapeless. And the summer film kind of finally, a few years ago, switched from film to the red camera and uh, Airy Alexa and so on and so on. So we've followed along, you know, with the digital uh, revolution as uh, in, in terms of the production aspects of it. But yeah, I, I've heard so much from, part of the thing that kept me doing it, and I, I think I directed 12 of the 25 summer films, was because students would, you'd watch them just change over the course of the production into, into becoming professionals. And many of them told me, you know, I learned so much. Uh, it, that kind of feedback just makes you want to keep doing it. Uh, and it's always different one summer to the next because a comedy is different than a drama, different than a family movie. You know, they're all different stories. So they have different elements, different locations, different uh, characters. Uh, so it was, it was, it was a, it's a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, a lot of long days, but but uh, I enjoyed it. One of the things that I really treasure in my memories of going to Grand Valley was my work on the several summer film projects that we worked on. It was always a very intense, very um, frenetic thing to do. We were all taking our summers and just doing this project. And the first one I worked on was an anthology film where we all wrote scripts and we all did different jobs in each of these scripts. And then at the end, we had like, a, like an assemblage film. And uh, that was really great. And then the next one we did was a, um, we had a, a, a partnership with Panavision and they brought in a big 35 millimeter camera and uh, a lady named Kelly Simpson came in and shepherded us through that. And that was an amazing, amazing experience. That's where I learned to be a camera assistant. And um, I learned to be a camera assistant because coming into the, uh, the program midstream as I did, I knew I wasn't going to be um, a DP or a director. So I, Gerb gave me a, a copy of the camera operator's manual and I went home and I read it and uh, got through it. And I was like, oh, camera assistant, they get to play with all the toys. I'll do that. And so I had uh, Kelly Simpson from Panavision who had been a camera assistant on the X-Files and the Commish and all these other shows that were in Vancouver. And she uh, taught me to be a camera assistant, which I started to do professionally after I left Grand Valley. But then the first uh, summer film project the next year, we shot that on the 16 millimeter uh, Panavision thing and I DP'd that. And uh, one of the things we did, we had a, a partnership with uh, Columbia in LA and Brianne Murphy came over 
and helped us with that. And she tutored me personally and took me back to LA with her. And that was an amazing experience. And uh, it was, it's a brilliant program. And it's one of the, it's one of the foundations of what really helped me to understand exactly what it takes to make a film. And uh, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite things I've ever done. One of my favorite memories from Grand Valley's film program was actually working on a peer's senior thesis. We were all a big crew that got together to help out on this big project, and it really felt like we were just part of a real film crew without any supervision, um, kind of different from the summer film. We had all done the summer film before, uh, so we kind of knew what we were doing, and it was a we were all able to just feel like this is the real deal now, you know, and we had so much fun. I remember shooting like in the middle of the night in a, in a graveyard and, um, and then at a grocery store in the middle of the night, like lots of night shoots. Um, but it was just so much fun and the product ended up being great and we all were really, really proud of it. I would have to say that my absolute favorite memory that I can think of just off the top of my head when I was a student is, uh, Gil, GMC Faux Show, actually showed up to be the host of the Grand Valley Film Academy Awards. I invited him because I was a fan and I think that he's a hilarious on YouTube. And I invited him and he actually showed up to host the event and he was in this huge like egg-shaped cape with feathers all over it and he was so funny and he like flew in singing his song <laughs> and he was just a, a total clown but he was actually really chill and fancy hosting the entire event i don't know i, I won't forget that it's really cool to have a connection with such a popular and really cool youtuber um and just a great person all around <laughs> The office that we were in at one time, there were uh, well, there was really just one editing bay, and so you know as people would line up to edit their shows, uh, there was really just a, a you know a fun atmosphere and and people joking and watching content and making suggestions and you know it was a club in the way that uh, we were all there having fun, but it was also a club in that we were all there pushing each other's art to the next level. When we would have our meetings, you know, it was all about, you know, watching the content, making suggestions. Uh, we all cared just so much to what we were putting on Channel 10 at the time, uh, making sure that if a student turned on that uh, TV to Channel 10, uh, they would see something that might hook them. Of course, there were disagreements and political struggles, but you know, all of that was because we cared so much about the direction of that organization. We understood that it was, you know, still brand new, and we were creating something that, uh, you know, hopefully would last for a long time at Grand Valley. And uh, I remember at, at one time I told somebody that, you know. I don't need to join a fraternity because uh, I have my own letters and those are GVTV. I was an active member of Grand Valley Television for all four years. I was an active e-board member for three years of my time. Um, and it was, it's hard to describe it as a professional experience because we had so much fun with it. We had such a blast, but we, it, it was a professional show for us, for all of us involved with GVTV. We were very dedicated to making content. We, we worked on news shows all together, um, but it's the place where I met all of my best friends and my closest collaborators. Um, I still am very close with the people that, um, that I met and became friends with through GVTV, and we still make work together. Um, I think though, to me, what was the most special experience about having a group like GBTV, though, was the opportunity to play and to learn that is outside of class. Um, I will give a little shout out to Randy, who's behind the scenes uh, pressing the buttons right now. Um, he was one of the first persons that I worked with on, um, on, a, on a new show that we worked on together. And he said, hey, have you used a microphone before? Have you plugged it into an Explorer cable? And I said, no, can you show me? And he showed me. Um, and that's kind of how I would describe the whole experience is that you have this opportunity 
to learn from each other and from people who have different levels of experience. It was a it was a safe place to go where if you wanted to try something out and just explore, that's where you could go. Um, but of course, you know, there were a lot of uh, different shows that we made, a lot of events we hosted, we did live, um, really for life, live streams. Um, and we, it was, it's, it was something that I, I have, very much held on to for very many years. Um, and it, I'm actually very pleased to hear that it's still going um, and that it's still, um, students are still having the opportunity to learn and to, um, you know, to make, to make things with each other. I love it. One of my favorite experiences from the film video program was for my first semester freshman year. I had two video courses and I had two projects going on at the same time. One of them was a stop motion animation project that I found myself working on in the basement of Lake Superior Hall till late, well, early in the morning. And then I had to wake up early and go shoot a documentary at a zoo about where they keep the animals in the winter time. And uh, it was a ton of work, but uh, just being able to get my hands dirty and work on all these different things, it just got me really excited and looking forward to what life would bring. I really appreciated the Grand Valley film program for many reasons. Uh, one of them was that we had so much access to equipment, instructors who cared, um, colleagues, students, everyone willing to help out. Um, I had heard later on that people who went to Michigan State or U of M or even UCLA had um, issues uh, getting access to equipment or all the facilities that we had for filmmaking resources. So I really appreciated learning that I had gone to the right place in addition to all the great instruction I got. And one of my favorite things that I did while I was attending was for the Fiction One class, I got to build my own Russian spaceship in the bottom of the Kirkhoff studio. And we were doing that for the project that I was chosen to have be one of the group projects in the class. So I wrote my script and we were able to have a student's budget and we were able to recreate what we could. And it was so helpful uh, to have the experience just building something from scratch. And I ended up transferring those skills over to some freelance art department jobs that I now hold in Los Angeles. So I am very thankful for having the opportunity at Grand Valley while I was still a student. One thing that I recall back when I was going to William James to Grand Valley in my day was I uh, had friends who were in a similar program at Michigan State, and they were talking about how they had to sign up for an hour of edit time. And my first response is, you can't do anything in an hour, especially when you're first starting out. This is a time-intensive uh, undertaking, no matter what you're doing. I mean, I've lost hours in editing time. Um, so I want to talk about that, both from Greg and Stephanie, about what kind of bond brings up because you do spend some really intense times in sometimes very enclosed spaces or in a basement uh, editing suite or someplace else with the students, but it really, it, it, it solidifies your network, your community, but also prepares you for working out in the real world. So um, I'm going to start with Greg. What can you recall about that time and how do you, how does it impact what you do now? Yeah, you do spend you do tend to spend a lot of uh, a lot of intense time with with people. And one of the one of the things I remember is we were editing this uh, this film and it was inspired by Apocalypse Now. And what we ended up doing was we were editing all night doing double system 16 mil and we had to take a break at some point and we just kind of got lost in the edit. And so we went out from the uh, the uh, edit room into one of the auditoriums and um, we put in a laser disc of Apocalypse Now and sat in the auditorium with that at full volume and we watched Apocalypse Now. And it was, it was one of those uh, experiences that you don't get to have very often. And it really, uh, it was really fantastic. And being able to come back to an edit after something like that was, was really great. Stephanie, how about some of your times? Yeah, I will actually also echo a great experience that uh, I couldn't even tell you how many times we like snuck into the Lake Superior uh, lecture halls and would project our our 
what we thought was our final cut on it. And then we'd realize something was messed up and we had to export it. But there was something about being in those edit suites at three in the morning with everybody else there too. Like I can't even describe that feeling. Um, I think one of my fondest memories I don't know if fond is the right word, actually, but one of my my uh, memories of, of one of the uh, most sleepless nights that I've ever had was the week before um, the thesis presentations. And I had been working on the editing, on the sound, on everything, and a group of us got together and said, Let's, let's finish this movie. I'll take the color. I'll do the mix. I'll do this. And we were all in different parts of campus. Someone was in Kirkhoff in the audio booth. Someone was in Lake Superior in the basement. Someone was at home uh, taking on a different aspect of it. And so it was this huge collaboration effort. And I slept in Lake Superior for five nights in a row because we had to get this project finished. And um, I forget who it was. I, I I want to say it might have been Deb in the film office. Um, I was sleeping on one of those, uh, just a, a couch. There was this little lounge and I was sleeping on the couch and it was like 7 a.m. And I hear like a little tap on the glass and I had only gotten like a two hour nap at that point. And I was like, oh my gosh, where am I? <laughs> okay, I'm still in Lake Superior. <laughs> Is the movie done? No, did I dream this? Um, and also, I mean, something about sleeping on the audio booth floor too, finding some like fallen pieces of audio foam that you turn into a mattress and decide to just, you know, take a little group nap together while you're in the middle of filming. <laughs> um, so I think there's, there's, there's something about the, it, it is an unbreakable bond. There is no way that after these experiences that you have making these projects together that you can ever be unfused. <laughs> um, so it is something that I, again, like I look back fondly now in the moment I wish like it would have been nice to eat, would have been nice to have some sleep, but you're in film school. This is what you have. <laughs> so um, yeah, one of, again, fondest memories. It puts you in the mindset of I'm really tired. My mind is foggy. I'm hungry. I haven't had a shower for I'm not sure how long. Let's go. Let's, Let's do it. <laughs> Let's Let the doing. adrenaline. As a project that had to have massive pre-production done to do this in one take. Um, we're gonna look at a clip on that now, but that was another thing that kind of uh, really stood out and got the film or video program some more recognition and was a, uh, a big exercise in how to get it done. So let's take a look at that. So a piece of Grand Valley's film history from 2010 was uh, the Grand Valley Lip Dub. And that was, of course, directed by Greg Court, who graduated in 2011. Hi, Greg. Hi, nice, nice to see you guys. And produced in a lot of ways by Kim Roberts, who was uh, at the faculty then and, of course, is a, a professor now. Nice. Um, so first of all, what what is a Lip Dub uh, and, and what was going on at the time and, and how did we get involved with that? Well, I, I guess at first I'll just I'll start with saying that uh, uh, one of the the co-director and co-producer of it as well was uh, a buddy of at the time uh, Chris Coleman, and he actually showed me uh, a lip dub for the first time. Uh, I think it was maybe in the spring of 2010, and it was uh, I think it was Kelvin Colleges. Kelvin College did a lip dub, and it was pretty good. And uh, he showed me Hope. that. Was it Hope? I was thinking it was Hope, but you might be right. It, they might have had one too, because it was yeah. it was a trend at the time, and a lot of people were doing them. Um, I, but I think it was Kelvin's. But regardless, it was right. another local college, and it did it did a pretty good job. But we kind of mm -hmm. saw it, and we're like, we could do we could do this, we could do a better one. And I think we got the ball rolling that end of that school year in the spring, and we kind of planted the seed at some point in in Kim's head, and she was fully supportive of our crazy ambitious ideas. And uh, over the course of that summer. Uh, we started lining things up. We got we got permission from uh, the president at the time, uh, President T. Haas, and we just started lining up the logistics for a fall shoot. I think we shot it early October or late September of 2010. Yeah, the idea with the lip dub is, and, and I'll get let Greg talk more about this, but it, it really had to be one shot. One continuous shot could not be edited visually. The video could not be edited, but the audio could be. So you could dub in some audio, but you had to lip sync it uh, in one shot. 
Yep. Yep. That was the whole, the challenge and the fun of it. And uh, it's kind of funny from looking at it from today because it's kind of a predecessor to like all this TikTok stuff. I mean, those are essentially glorified lip dub videos, you know, uh, but the, they, they were fun though. And, and I think what we tried to do with Grand Valleys was, and we can talk about uh, how we started to come up with some of the things, but um, you know, the longer, longer, the better, right? The more impressive is how long you can do it without cutting. And, and what song was that? And how did you end up picking that song to represent, you know, the whole school? Uh, I think we were watching Freaks and Geeks, the, the show, the Judd Apatow <laughs> show, Freaks and Geeks. I think it's the first episode or one of the early episodes, they go to like the prom or the homecoming and they, they dance to come sail away. And it's a really funny scene. Uh, but anyways, that, I think that was the, that was kind of the inspiration. Like, oh my God, this song's kind of perfect. It's long. It's, it's, uh, you know, everyone kind of knows it. It's easy to sing. It'd be easy for performers to, to get their lyrics quickly. Um, and then the whole, you know, sailing and Lakers and, you know, it just fit Grand Valley so well. So once we kind of, uh, heard that song and it popped in our heads, it just made sense. And all of this like logistics and production all ended up paying off. This became national news. Uh, you know, what were people saying and, you know, what did that even feel like to, to have that blow up like that? Well, it was, it was crazy. I, I do remember we had a little, uh, we, I was, we were up late getting the video ready and then, uh, in me and, uh, Chris's, uh, naiveness we just went ahead and posted the video without getting it approved by kim and everyone else that probably needed to see it and uh and i remember i we posted it and we went to sleep and i woke up to like a million messages of people saying it looked awesome but kim was also like we got to take this down we gotta because we didn't have any i don't think we had a thank you credits we didn't put on it at the time so we ended up having to take it down originally and re-put some credits on there as as we should have and uh, we reposted it. So it lost a little bit of momentum, but eventually it caught steam again. And uh, yeah, it got, it got a lot of, at least local press and, and some international. Um, and it was it was crazy. It was like we, you know, it, people were impressed by it. Uh, I think we had um, a couple of little interviews about it. Uh, and, and I ultimately ended up getting a job offer over it. So I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Oh my gosh, yeah. And then the graduation, um, uh, books that they have where they have a timeline of all the cool things of Grand Valley's history. The lip dub is on that timeline. Oh, cool. That's yeah. really sweet. Mm -hmm. So still having an effect today and, and certainly part of Grand Valley history. So thanks for, for talking about this. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Randy. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate the, the little mini reunion. It's good to see you guys. <laughs> One of the benefits of being around long enough and having all this evolution go through is that uh, in 2015, we had a reunion, uh, pulled together a lot of the folks uh, who had been involved in the program. And it was great on my stand. I got to meet, you know, catch up with people I hadn't seen in a long time, uh, other folks I knew were in market, but also meet some of the uh, faculty and students I hadn't had a chance to know. Um, so it was a great chance to, you know, see what people are doing and hear how the program was developing and just was a, a great uh, community event. Again, it's uh, that, that network, the community that's been put together um, that really, I think, was a, 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 a just a, a great party. Um, anybody else want to jump in with their, their thoughts about the event? I think Greg was the, gets the award for the longest commute, right? <laughs> he came from Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a great event. Um, of course, a lot of planning went into it. Um, again, we a shout out to Suzanne Zach uh, for doing a phenomenal amount of work. Um, and and then, you know, kind of, well, simultaneously starting the alumni chapter that same year. So really putting more um, energy and resources into formalizing some of these connections that we've been talking about with the reunion and then also with the alumni chapter of which this is a production. But the, um, yeah, just seeing all the people there from all the different generations and it was a great party. Um, we had lots of fun things happening that night, um, lots of video coverage of it. So we had lot, it was very well documented. Um, I'm not sure when we'll do another one, but it was, it was definitely, a, a wonderful and worthwhile and very fun event. One uh, funny story from the reunion where I saw uh, Don Stearns, one of our alum, give uh, Jim Schaub a hundred dollar bill. And I was like going, what's going on here, guys? And it, 
and and uh, Jim, back when Don was a student and he was dating Amy, said, uh, "I'll bet you a hundred dollars you two are going to get married." And and now it was whatever many years later, and Don came up and went, "Here, here's your hundred bucks." <laughs> they were married, so that was fun. Well, he probably paid it off with a smile then, so it wasn't like he lost anything really. <laughs> As the uh, the evolution of the program goes and uh, evolution in Grand Valley goes, um, can you talk about that? I, I would imagine that uh, Tony and John probably the most to, to shed light on that. But uh, how does that uh, I, come around and where does it go? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, what Tony was saying earlier, we have you know, film video has had so many great faculty, um, you know, and, and that's not always how it is. I've been told from other. Uh, professors at other universities that sometimes there's there's infighting or there's tension and we always just had the best luck not only with the full-time people but with all the visitors so I just want to say that and that that's one of my best memories of Grand Valley is just being along so well with the faculty like like a family um, but when the the VMA thing uh, they decided to break up the school comm I guess it was getting too big and uh, they put theater off with music and dance, and they put uh, film and video production and photography with uh, art and design, and then they renamed it uh, the Department of Visual and Media Arts. And, uh, and that's sort of where it's at now, and they're still trying to sort out, you know, grand, uh, film video brought, I think, like 300 majors into the program. So uh, it, you know, it was a big change for art and design, and I think, you know, they're, they're still figuring out the best way to make it all work and be cohesive and so on. I don't know if Tony wants to add to that, but. Yeah, I don't know that I have much more to add, except that it is still a work in progress. I would say there's some uh, growing pains happening there and um, the pandemic hasn't helped anything in that regard, um, just in terms of this uh, transition, but a lot of positive energy on the part of the faculty. Hopefully they will um, make an even stronger program than what has you know, evolved over the years up till now. I would say that, um, that the, um, it's something in terms of the growth. So kind of getting back to what was John was saying was like, we've had such a fabulous experience with are um, in as faculty members with our colleagues that I really think is a rare thing um, that we really love one another. And um, we've been so fortunate that way to have people to work with that we really, really admire and have fun with and enjoy being with. And we disagree and we fight and, um, but we, you know, it's all to, to make the program better. Um, and we've had that kind of, you know, extraordinary, I would say, kind of relationship over the whole time that I was there. And so I'm, I'm hoping that that going into the future that will continue um, and we'll see how, how it evolves going from here because we've kind of, you know, left the, the younger generation now to, to work on some of the, um, the changes and the challenges, which are striking, or you mean they're hitting the university in general and not just Grand Valley, but all around the country. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a great experience in terms of my, my 30 years and hopefully that will continue going forward. Well, I think we are collectively just a representative group of a lot of people out there who look back on the film and video program in our days with a lot of uh, a lot of pride and um, just great memories and uh, and you know a lot a lot of faith that the program will go forward and surprise us in new ways. Is there um, anybody else who wants to add a closing thought before we sign off? I'd just like to say that uh, that my time at Grand Valley was some of the most formative parts of my education and that I was incredibly close with all of my instructors and all of the students that I either worked with as a teacher assistant or as a, a maker and collaborator. And I'm really proud to have been a part of this program. I have a lot of fond memories from there, from uh, the great teachers, Tony, Barb, Deanna, Gerb, uh, Scott, all, I mean, they were all awesome teachers. They taught me what I need to know now um, for what I do. I'm a sound mixer. 
prepping for uh, Michael Bay's uh, new movie starting up here uh, next week. And I wouldn't be here where I am today without uh, all those guys. And I bump into people, my classmates too. I mean, your classmates are a huge part of it. I bump into people that I went to school with out here. Uh, Chris Bangma and I um, see each other on film sets for the past 20 years out here. I am such a proud alumni. I was actually getting chills watching some of the clips that uh, you were sharing on screen and uh, Laker for life. That's all I'll say is that I'm a Laker for a lifetime. <laughs> John, um, I, I I had a great experience. I, I when I came to Grand Valley, I don't think I necessarily thought I would spend my entire career there. I figured oh, I'll do I'll do a few years here and then maybe see what else is out there. And I just it just it was a great fit, and I had the students were great. Uh, and uh, you know, as Tony says, no, I'm I'm still watching how it will evolve in the new department, but I'm watching from home instead of from my office. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, I had a blast. Well, great. I want to thank everybody for the time you've put in today from, uh, since this is the, the new way to gather virtual and hopefully we'll get back to more in-person gatherings. Um, but thank you for your time. Thank you for your thoughts as uh, just one more session in the ongoing conversation. Um, and thanks again. Thank you, Tim. Love you, Greg. Thanks, See you guys. Hi, everybody. Bye, guys. <laughs>